Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Natalia Kurop and I will be your moderator for this morning's webinar. I'm afraid due to technical issues, we won't be able to present via video camera today, but you will be able to see the presentation. To briefly introduce myself, I'm a partner with Dover Partners, the executive search and consultancy firm. We are known for helping European trade associations develop communications and media relations strategies in EU defence cases. Today's webinar is proudly brought to you by the preeminent law firm Field Fisher, which specialises in a number of key practices, including trade. Today's presenters are Laurent Roosman and Jochen Beck, who lead Field Fisher's trade practice. Together, Laurent and Jochen have more than 50 years of expertise in the area of trade law. The topic of today's 50 minute webinar is EU trade policy, open strategic autonomy requires effective international trade tools. Laurent will kick off the webinar with a brief overview of the challenges for the EU in a changing global economy and how to address them. Jochen will then delve into issues and topics related to EU trade defence instruments. Laurent will follow this by presenting some thoughts on other tools to safeguard fair trade and a level playing field. Now, before we kick off today's presentations, I have a few housekeeping points to bring to your attention. We warmly invite you to pose questions that you may have for us during the presentations. We will endeavour to cover these at the end of the presentation, but if we don't get to cover your questions here today, we would be very happy to arrange a separate one-to-one -one discussion with either Laurent or Jochen at some point following this webinar. You will find the question tab in the control panel next to the video panel. If you click on the arrow, a text box appears and you can type your questions to us there. If for any reason the presentation slide is too small, you can adjust it by rolling your mouse over the top, which will give you the option of adjusting the size to meet your needs. Now, before I hand over to Laurent to give his presentation, I will quickly pass uh, Jochen, who will ask you to participate in a couple of quick polls, which will help guide the detail of our presentations today. We hope that you will participate. And now it's over to you, Jochen. Thank you, Natalia. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining our uh, webinar today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, as Natalia said, the topic is um, the challenges of the 21st century's um, changed economical reality for the EU industry. And just to kick off with a quick fun poll, um, we'd like to ask your opinion, how effective do you think the current trade measures or more specific the trade defenses have been for your industry? If you please make your vote now by clicking on one of the four possible answers. Okay, I'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay, and I'm going to close the poll in five, four, okay, the poll will be now closed. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, basically, you can see the results here. Your results basically fully reflect how we also feel about um, TDIs. And that's why we would like to share some of the challenges and our thoughts for improvement with you during this call today. And uh, Laurent will be taking over for the first part. Thanks, Jochen. And thanks, Jochen, and good morning, everyone. So, what I want to do in this first part is just give an introduction and talk about the context in which we find ourselves. So, we have these challenges in a changing global economy, and we want to examine how to best address them. We start with the, the foundation, which is EU industry needs a level playing field. 
Of course, in the EU, you all know this, we have many, many innovative, environmentally friendly, very sophisticated industries that are making essential contributions to the EU economy, to EU society. And we need these industries to be able to have a level playing field on which to compete. The challenges in general, you have challenges even within the EU itself, of course, with Brexit, as it has been coming down to the wire, you have the evolving trade policy, this whole question of what is open strategic economy. We have other regulatory policies that affect the trade picture. And here we're looking specifically now at the Green Deal and how that will affect trade flows. Uh, from the US side, there have been a number of uh, what can we say, irritants over the last couple of years. And now we have possible changes under the new US presidency. With China, we have a continuing uh, set of issues regarding subsidized overcapacities and foreign investments. And of course, there's the question of WTO reforms. And it's a constant question mark. Will they happen? How will they happen? What will they look like? Effective EU action in the face of all these developments requires overcoming some, what we could say, our traditional obstacles, hesitation, slow response times, and a lack of unity. Jean-Claude Juncker said very famously, we are not naive free traders, and we need to back that up and put that into practice. To ensure that EU industry has a level playing field, we suggest considering some new approaches. So, and we highlight here three points in particular. One would be to shorten reaction times to make things happen quicker. The second would be to interpret existing rules to be able to address 21st century challenges. What do I mean by that? Essentially, we have seen over the years that the commission has been very careful to abide by, of course, the rule of law, but it's considered the WTO rules in, in I would say, an increasingly narrow and restrictive sense, a very conservative sense. And what we see is that the evolving economy and the evolving global challenges uh, really require a new look, a new way of interpreting the existing rules. Well, we'll go into that a bit more in detail a bit later. And then the third point would be to adopt the new unilateral tools, unilateral in the sense of within the EU legal system where the existing tools are inadequate. So we will go now into the trade defense instruments uh, section of the presentation, and I will give it back to Jochen for that. Thank you, Doral. Um, so let's look now um, how the trade defense instruments work in a 21st century environment and where there might be room for improvement. Let's maybe start off with a fun poll again. Um, how many TDI investigations, new TDI investigations, do you think the Commission has launched in 2019? Please make your vote now by clicking on one, one of the following answers. Okay, I give you another uh, 10 seconds. Please vote if you haven't done so yet. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm gonna close the poll shortly. If you want to vote, last chance. Okay. Great, thank you for your participation. Actually, um, you're quite right with your um, guesses, or maybe some of you know it, it was indeed 16 and only 16 cases that the commission initiated new cases in 2019. So as you can see, this also brings um, the first challenge or the first room for improvement uh, of the TTI tools, mainly namely making them better and, and wider available to EU industry, and most importantly, earlier. We'll look at it in a moment. Um, but 
the commission, as Laurent said, has acknowledged the need for um, for refreshment, renovation, and wider application of TDI rules as well as the enforcement rules. And I want to just highlight uh, um, a couple of, I think, very important examples of this that the commission did over the last years. So very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, the commission adopted the Russia report. And similar to the report on China, the Russia report will now enable EU industries in complaints to replace distorted costs in Russia with market costs, market prices from third countries um, in, in their complaints and in the investigations. The Commission has also last year finalized um, the legal framework to apply anti-dumping measures to the continental shelf and anti-subsidy measures as well. That was not possible in the past, is now possible if um, the product subject to the duties is used uh, intensively or strongly in, in, in those continental shelf areas like uh, um, wind tower um, parks or oil drilling platforms. And in fact, the wind tower complaint that was recently filed um, specifically requested the extension of TDIs to the offshore. The Commission has also made more use of its opportunity to initiate the cases ex officio and has done so in 2019, particularly with regard to anti circumvention cases. And probably the most important new development um, we have seen is that the Commission has for the first time, and that's a global worldwide first, um, countable subsidies from a third country. What exactly does that mean? And let's have a look at that. So in June 2020, so just a couple of months ago, in two parallel anti-subsidy investigations, the Commission imposed subsidy duties on imports of glass fiber reinforcement and glass fiber fabrics from Egypt. These duties, um, subsidy duties did not only address and countervail the subsidies provided by Egypt, but also those subsidies that could ultimately be traced back to China. Now, when we brought the complaint, uh, Laurent and I presented to your industry in this case, uh, in both cases, we, we basically had one challenge to overcome. And that is, if you do a very conservative and narrow reading of the applicable rules, then one could interpret interpret them as only regulating the provision of or countervailing the, the provision of subsidies by the country where the production is located. So we had to overcome this hurdle uh, and convince the Commission to also circumvent, uh, so, sorry, countervail the subsidies coming from China. And essentially, how did we do that? We, we explained to the Commission the, the, the factual background that was very important here. Namely, the only producer in Egypt was a Chinese company, Chinese, Chinese state-owned company, um, that basically had established its subsidiary in Egypt in response to the increase of subsidy and dumping duties on direct export of gas fiber reinforcements from China. They basically announced that this plant was built to circumvent. We also found that this plant was not just built with the company's own money, but Besides being state-owned, it received about two, one third of the total investment sum in subsidies from China and Egypt. On top, it was located in an economic zone that was under the Belt and Road Agreement, essentially given by Egypt to China to establish an autonomous zone that is controlled and operated by Chinese government bodies. So with all this information um, we presented to the Commission, the Commission agreed finally with us and it, it looked at the situation and then it concluded that in international law interpretation of what is a government action, that what Egypt did here is basically acknowledged and adopted as, as their own activities and as their own subsidies, the subsidies coming from China. And therefore those subsidies were attributable to um, Egypt and therefore countervailable. So this is really a, a massive step forward in the interpretation and application of subsidy rules. And we hope that this sets a strong foundation for the future to address these um, Chinese circumvention hubs that we see basically popping up in several countries more and more. Another area where we think there is room for improvement are the enforcement measures. So when measures are in place, when you have succeeded to get 
dumping or subsidy duties, you of course want to make sure that they apply uh, effectively. And there are two specific tools available that can help you achieve that, but both tools um, have their limits and would need improvement in the 21st century reality. So the one tool is anti-circumvention and the other is anti-absorption. Anti-absorption, as the name says, implies that the duties are undermined by the exporter um, swallowing part of it or all of it. Usually this is done in form of redu reduction of export prices. So for instance, in the solar glass case, uh, we help the solar glass industry obtaining anti-dumping duties and anti-subsidy duties on imports from China. The anti-dumping duties were in the range of 36%, the subsidy duties were in the range of 17%. Following the imposition of these measures, the Chinese industry, the Chinese producers that exported to Europe dropped their export prices by up to 30%. Seeing that the commission initiated um, an absorption review and increased the dumping duties from 36 to to 71 percent. That was actually a great result for the industry and um, from then on the measures were effective. So that remedy worked. But this case also shows two main um, fundamental flaws with the tool. The first is, if you listen carefully, the Commission only um, did the, the anti-sorption investigation for the dumping case. Under the subsidy regulation, the, the rules on absorption are so weak that they are factually not applicable. So in a, if, if the solar glass industry would have had only subsidy measures in place, they would not have been able to use this absorption remedy. They would have had to file for an interim review, which is a much longer procedure, much higher burden of proof, and um, simply not effective to give a quick remedy to avoidings of duty payments. The second issue with that is that the solar glass industry was in a sense lucky that the absorption activities happened immediately because the commission's practice is normally to apply it only for between within the first two years after the imposition of initial measures. So had Chinese exporting producers, for instance, first try to circumvent and then absorb, they might have been outside the two year period and again, not had recourse to that remedy, but had to go for longer um, higher burden um, and more difficult um, interim review. So these are the two issues areas that there would be definitely room for improvement in the absorption tool. Um, the second enforcement tool is anti-circumvention. So there are some straightforward simple circumventions that the Commission has actually addressed in its ex officio review investigations over the last years. Um, but the one that is more complicated um, is the assembly. So basic assembly means, we have seen that for instance, a lot in the bicycle cases, Chinese, uh, the EU imposed anti-dumping duties on export of Chinese bicycles. Um, as a circumvention tool, the Chinese industry ships bicycle parts to Malaysia, assembles them there, and then ships the assembled bicycle from Malaysia to the EU. Now, to the extent that these assembly operations are relatively straightforward and don't add added value. This is actually a, a circumvention activity. However, as you might see, um, the, it, it will take a lot of information and evidence to prove this, to show that this is actually happening. Now, and here's the first issue with, with the tool is the court has repeatedly interpreted or held that non-cooperation um, cannot be taken as an evidence of, of um, circumvention and assembly happening. The issue with that though is that of course an assembler has no or very little um, encouragement to cooperate and disclose any information to the commission. So there is there is a, a burden of proof issue here and it would help to clarify it in the regulation that the burden of proof for non-cooperation is not simply shifted onto the commission. Another example, if we go back to Yushi Egypt, um, you saw they get subsidies of almost a third of their total investment costs. Now, traditionally the assembly tool or the convention tool is, is thought to apply to simple, simple operations, but not anymore if this um, operation in the circumventing country gets more substantial, because then it's assumed to be no longer a link to the initial country where that, that was subject to duties. 
And that can make sense in some circumstances, but however, the logic gets reversed if you think about subsidization. If a, if a company gets so many subsidies from its, um, get subsidies from its home country to establish assembly operation, that could be subject to circumvention rules. But if it gets so much more subsidies that it can even produce a set of a whole separate um, production site, then there is a cut and the circumvention rules can no longer apply. That's probably something that people didn't have in mind when the law was drafted, but it's definitely an area where now we see with reality like Yushi Egypt, there is room for change. So to wrap up, these are just um, examples, some examples for your information. We have a little survey at the end of this presentation. Um, if you would like to know more about um, the circumvention and absorption tools and suggested improvements, um, you can select there that, um, that we share with you an article Laurent and I had written a couple of weeks ago uh, on this topic, if you're interested in more information. So to sum up, um, the rooms for improvement, one very important one um, is the recognition of, uh, of threat of injury earlier. Uh, we see in many cases that the Commission has as a general approach to expect a new industry to be first injured kind of on the ground and bleeding before they start investigations. Um, this is basically costly at two points to the industry and the EU economy. So first we, we have costs um, while the industry basically drops in performance, loses market share, employees, uh, profits. Then we have subsidy investigation and ideally measures and if everything goes well, then the industry is building up again. So this drop and going up, uh, this basically downward curve, um, there is economic costs to the industry and the EU as a whole that basically are necessary and can be avoided if we allow threat of injury cases to happen early. We talked about to make anti-circumvention and the absorption tools more uh, effective and to use them quicker. Um, Yushi Egypt also opens the question whether it would not be useful to allow addressing those type of circumvention hubs by, for instance, allowing the application of 26A, so the significant distortion rule, to those Chinese enclaves um, that basically operate under Chinese control and laws and also whether it is not um, valid to extend the circumvention tool, as we just discussed before, to cases like Yushi Egypt. And finally, um, the burden of proof. As we saw, there are several cases where through the shift of burden of proof, um, the exporting producers actually benefit by not disclosing information. For instance, in the investigation of a subsidy scheme, if the commission doesn't have the information to the know or the, the, the clear evidence to the know the subsidy is there, then it would not circumvent the subsidy, uh, specific subsidy. Therefore, there is an incentive for exporting producer to provide as little information as possible in those circumstances. A burden of proof shift would help here making the measures more effective. Thank you, Jochen. Would you like so to run the poll now? Um, so we have a last poll for you to introduce Laurent's part, and then I'm happy to give over to him. The question is, have you experienced unfair competition from abroad where TDI could not help you? So are there any circumstances that you see, okay, we, we experienced that, but we could not use TDIs to address that? And if your answer is yes, maybe you want to share in your questions, um, comments, um, a little bit more detail if you would like to do that. Okay, we have... Um, we'll give you another 15 seconds to vote. Please vote now. Okay, any more votes? Good, we're closing in five. All right, thank you for voting.
So what do you say? Most of you say, say yes, you have experienced um, unfair competition by TDI tools, don't I can't help you. Um, that's very interesting. And we hope therefore that you will particularly enjoy Laurent's next part of the presentation. Great, thank you, Joachim. So in this part of the presentation, I'd like to focus on three areas. The first is the distortive effect of foreign subsidies. And the second is achieving a level playing field in the Green Deal. Third is improving enforcement of market access rights vis-a-vis -vis third countries and market access conditions coming into the EU. And for this section, we'll talk first about subsidies. Now, subsidies is generally associated with trade defense, but the Commission is proposing a new tool or set of tools to address distortions caused by foreign subsidies. So we do have existing legislation on foreign subsidies, investment screening and public procurement, which all deal to some extent with foreign subsidies, but each of them has their limitations. One of the questions that's come up in the the process by which the Commission has been consulting with industry and other stakeholders in on this area is the question of whether guidance would be sufficient, guidance on the application of existing rules, or whether we need new rules, or whether we should wait and negotiate international rules, new international rules. And I think there is this, well, there seems to be some consensus that guidance alone would not be sufficient and that we cannot wait for new international rules. Similarly, we cannot rely simply on member states to, to deal with foreign subsidies, uh, just as we don't expect member states to deal completely with state aid issues. So we need EU level action under the EU's com common commercial policy would be a logical conclusion there. One important point for those sectors which do have products which have benefited from trade defense measures is the point that actually foreign subsidies cause all sorts of distortions in the EU market, and it's not limited to the price of imports. It could be with regard to acquisition of intellectual property rights. It could be in public procurement. It can be in the upstream or downstream situations. So there are a lot of ways in which basically every sector should be able to benefit from these new tools. And if there was an issue with regard to double coverage, then that could be addressed in the, the specific situation that would be uh, looked at. But we're still very early in the process. The commission did the white paper in the, in the summer of this year. There was just a follow-up consultation. And the follow-up consultation, I would say is, is somewhat concerning in the sense of uh, letting us think that they're not aiming very high. It's It doesn't seem that the commission's level of ambition is that great. So we'll have to see what comes out in the next step of the, the process. But I think that is something that certainly has large potential. And of course, if it gets the attention of third countries and they are saying, well, be careful, don't do it, uh, we don't like it. It would be against the WTO rules. This is a sure sign that it, you may have put your finger on something that could be effective. The second area I'd like to talk about is the Green Deal and the carbon border adjustment. So we have a lot of different regulatory regimes in the EU dealing with whether it's labor standards, environmental standards, climate change, where we have put a certain burden on EU industry and EU production. And the question is, what do we do to have a level playing field with regard to imports? And the whole idea with the carbon border adjustment is that it would level the playing field as between the EU's climate ambitions and the generally lower climate ambitions in third countries. The, the question is how to do it in a way that brings about a match between things that are not really matched in other words, we have currently in the EU the ETS, the Emissions Trading System, which looks at the emissions of each industrial plant in the EU in the sectors covered by the ETS. And the idea would be to somehow apply to products coming into the EU a costing system that 
gives a roughly similar burden to those imports compared to domestic production. An important question is, how do you measure that carbon footprint of imports? To what extent do you go for a shortcut and make use of benchmarks? Uh, do you consider transport emissions? Because under the ETS, we're just looking at the emissions in the production in the EU, but with imports, of course, you don't just have the production at the local plant, you also have the transport to the EU border. And should we not include the carbon footprint of transport as well? There is also the question of which products will this actually apply to? When you look at what the Commission has been consulting on so far, it seems pretty clear that the Commission is aiming again at, at a very limited uh, scope of products. They talk about certain products of the sectors most at risk of carbon leakage. But as soon as you start to limit the scope of the products covered, you naturally come up with the question, well, what happens to downstream sectors? And would there be a risk of simply pushing carbon leakage risks downstream? In other words, if, for example, we have a carbon border adjustment applied to primary steel products, what about manufacturers of auto parts who all of a sudden would see their costs go up, not just for domestic EU production because of the greater costs of the EU producers due to the higher climate ambitions, but also a higher cost to the extent that they would import those steel products from outside the EU. So with those higher costs, they would be less competitive than against imports of their products. So there is this question that needs to be looked at in this uh, design of the proposal. Another issue is the linkage with emissions costing in third countries. One of the things that commission officials have talked about is not having the carbon border adjustment mechanism take effect for a couple of years after it would be adopted in order to give time to negotiate linkages with third countries which would have similar climate ambitions. And of course, it would could easily pose a problem in terms of uh, verification of what's happening in third countries and in fact mismatching uh, with countries that really don't have a similar level of ambition. One of the questions for example that comes up is China because China has an emissions trading system but it's very rudimentary and as I understand it it only applies at this point uh, to electricity generation. So there is the question of how you would go about linking up with third countries and, and what that would do to possibly dilute the impact of a, a carbon border adjustment. Then, of course, there's the position of those sectors who are currently in the ETS and who are benefiting from free allowances as well as indirect cost compensation because they have an issue with the Commission saying actually the carbon border adjustment mechanism would replace the current carbon leakage measures, which are the free allowances and the indirect cost compensation. And these sectors are essentially saying, wait a minute, there's no justification to remove the current carbon leakage measures, considering that in any event, the carbon border adjustment mechanism will have a very limited product scope. And at this point, because we don't know the concrete design of the CBA, we don't know what the impact will be to limit carbon leakage in, in, in practice. So these are some important issues in looking to have a level playing field in the climate regulatory area. The third area I'd like to look at is free trade agreements, market access, and the chief enforcement officer. So in the last few years, we've had an increased focus of the commission on improving enforcement commission and the member states and the parliament on improving enforcement of free trade agreements and WTO rulings. That's led to three uh, related initiatives. The first is the revision of the enforcement regulation, which focuses on the enforcement of uh, dispute resolution outcomes and free trade agreements and on the implementation of WTO rulings. And there, the commission proposal has finally uh, reached an agreement between the Council and the Parliament uh, and the Commission in the trilogue process, and that will be published very soon. Then you've had the appointment in the last month or so of 
DG Trade's chief enforcement officer. So a new position created specifically to uh, give DG Trade more focus on this area. And that's the Deputy Director General, uh, Denis Rodenay. And you just have the announcement this week, in fact, of a new complaint system, which has been set up to handle complaints for uh, better enforcement in this area. A second element, which is not unrelated to the first, is an increased focus on the sustainability chapter in FTAs. What are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, rules concerning uh, labor standards, environmental standards, and we have uh, more and more in the FTAs uh, a chapter devoted to ensuring that both sides in of particular interest for EU stakeholders are what's happening in our partner uh, countries. And then the concern has been that there hasn't been adequate enforcement there or enforcement provisions and or follow-up. And so there's an increased focus there. Uh, but I would say it remains to be seen what will be done to make that uh, more effective. And then a third area is the question of more active use of the trade barriers regulation. And I bring this up because it's been a frustration, I think, of EU stakeholders over the years. And it's shown in the fact that the trade barriers regulation has been used relatively little. Uh, it has been called on a bit more recently, but again, there hasn't been a strong use of it because it doesn't really have a, a clear procedure. It doesn't have a, a strong basis for action. Um, it's supposed to be patterned a bit along the lines of what in the United States is called the Section 301, which allows for quick action when other countries are violating uh, the rights of domestic interests. But because of the EU's position in terms of the WTO, that everything first has to go to WTO dispute settlement with regard to w other WTO members, uh, this regulation has been really of limited use. And this also relates to the enforcement regulation. That again, it, that regulation has only kicked in once there was a ruling the revision of the enforcement regulation does expand that somewhat to the extent you have a ruling, a panel ruling, but uh, because of the situation at the appellate body level, if the other party is uh, not part of the multi-party arbitration uh, setup the EU has in place now, then the EU can take some action. But again, it's it's relatively limited in what it allows the EU to do on a unilateral basis. So these are the recent developments, but there's probably still room for improvement. Now we're going to basically summarize what we've gone through today and give you a chance to have some questions. So first, the conclusion I would say is that open strategic autonomy, whatever its content is to be defined as, cannot wait for WTO reforms. Uh, this is something I've heard consistently from clients and from EU industry in general. So open strategic autonomy is still to be defined. We've just had this trade policy review uh, which solicited input from EU stakeholders on what that should involve. I think it, there is a certain consensus that it should include more assertive use of existing tools, as well as the adaptation of the toolbox. We need new tools, including, for example, tools to deal with foreign subsidies more effectively. It should also include more effective enforcement. And, you know, this is a perennial issue, but especially in times where we see producers in third countries, first of all, having very great state support, in the kind of situations that Jochen discussed earlier, and they move quicker in the modern uh, situation. So we need to have more effective enforcement, a continued focus there. And I would say key EU actors have a critical role. The commission itself, uh, when we talk about existing tools, can make more assertive use of them and can conduct enforcement in a more assertive manner. The EU legislator, the member states, the MEPs, can move to quickly put in place effectively updated or and or additional tools. 
And of course, stakeholders have an opportunity to weigh in. And this leads to our last slide, which is you have a voice and speaking up does bring change. So clearly you can tell member state trade experts, trade ministers, commission officials, MEPs and the public about the need for more sort of use of existing tools and the need for updated or additional legislative tools. And of course, you should also be telling them about the added value 21st century solutions that your sectors bring to the EU economy and to society more broadly, whether it's in terms of employment and job creation, your role in health and environmental protection, or your role in supply and value chain innovations and growth. Thank you very much. And with that, we will look at some questions, I think. Okay. So maybe I can ask the questions. Uh, I'll, I'll indicate who they've come from and uh, we can work our way through them. So Johannes Bono has requested to know, is it conceivable to apply EU state aid rules when assessing foreign subsidies within the EU's TDI regime? Laurent, would you like to take that one? Sure. So is it conceivable to apply EU state aid rules when an assessing foreign subsidies. And there's another question, extra costs for EU industry caused by the EU Green Deal should be taken into account under the EU's TDI regime. Can it be done by using the current rules or do we need to wait for reformed EU TDI infrastructure? Very good questions. So, in terms of applying EU state aid rules when assessing foreign subsidies, I think you, you could try. Uh, the difficulty, well, let's say it this way. The definition of what is a subsidy uh, should be seen very broadly. And you do, of course, have a de minimis rule with regard to EU subsidies, uh, EU state aid. That might be problematic when you're looking at foreign subsidies. And the reason I say that is because of the lack of transparency. Whereas we have relatively good transparency within the EU, we have very poor transparency when it comes to foreign subsidies. Uh, that's just one general comment. I, I think personally that whenever you're dealing with foreign subsidies, you essentially have to look at it and in the way the DG Trade does in terms of, well, you, you can take a sample of the companies involved, but you have to also have effective sanctions for non-cooperation and the lack of transparency, especially in a situation where, although other WTO members are obliged under the WTO rules to declare annually their subsidies to the WTO, it's really not respected uh, substantially by, for example, China. And so if we only applied the EU state aid rules, that would be, uh, I think, a significant drawback there. With regard to the a Green Deal and taking into account the Green Deal in the current TDI rules, I think there are ways in which we could bring more into the current TDI rules uh, the environmental costs for EU industry. So the Commission has done it so far in a very limited way, well, the EU legislator, in the choice of a reference country in the application of the uh, dumping methodology. But, it, it, well, and also in the uh, injury margin. But it could do so, I think, in a more substantial way in the, how we construct the normal value, for example, considering that environmental costs are a natural element in the cost of production. Another way to do it would be in the union interest assessment, where it's a question of, is it in the union interest to impose measures? And we could introduce there the principle that to the extent that the EU producers are following a, a stricter environmental regime than what's happening in the third country under investigation, that should be a consideration as well in favor of imposing measures because you want to favor production where it's cleanest. Those are a couple of ideas. I, and there are uh, other ideas being tossed around, but it's certainly, I think, something that's worth developing. And I think it can be done under the existing rules if the commission is willing to be a bit more assertive there. We have another question. 
Maybe, Maybe just, just to, to add to, to this um, for a second, um, it is indeed the fact that the current TTI rules um, don't really take much account of, of um, this environmental cost, but they do in, in a couple of regards. Um, the Commission has also accordingly adjusted their cost tables in, in questionnaire responses, for instance. And they can play a, a role, for instance, when establishing target profit or the question of applying the lesser duty rule or not. Okay, we have uh, a couple more questions that have just come in. Um, I will just read through them. Finding common ground across industry sectors can be difficult. Some sectors do not mind foreign subsidies because it makes their end products more competitive. How do you expect the Commission to engage with such, such sectors, for example, the car makers, and face calls for strengthened multilateral approaches via the WTO? And that came from Nicholas Cabels. So who would like to take that one? Laurent, would you like to take the lead on that? Sure. So this is, yes, this is a, a real issue that you do have differences in approaches across sectors. And to a certain extent, you do have sectors which are not totally opposed to foreign subsidies. I think this is where in the Commission's consultation on foreign subsidies, dealing with foreign subsidies, it puts in an EU uh, interest assessment, essentially to allow for some arbitration between competing EU interests. I think it would be interesting to see uh, to what extent you could have a consensus that there should at least be a basic principle that we don't want to be hooked on foreign uh, drugs. <laughs> and we do want to see uh, an EU uh, level playing field so that even if there is a certain temporary benefit to one sector or another, that that should not be uh, an obstacle to dealing with the distortions that are created by those subsidies. But it is it is something that the Commission has talked about taking into account in the EU interest part of the uh, of that tool. Thank you. Yoko. There is uh, one final question that perhaps Natalia, we could ask. Hmm? Sorry, maybe if I can briefly add to that. Um, in, what we see is that industry usually don't mind foreign subsidies as long as they benefit from it. But when the foreign industries come down the value chain and start competing at their own level, then this changes. And especially in the last months in the COVID situation, we have seen that um, actually uh, relying solely on, on global value chains and supply chains is probably not the best idea and something we should rethink. There is a value to have a, a, a good value added chain and supply chain within Europe. And actually the industries we work with, we see that um, there is a lot of benefit coming from the joint development programs, the, the opening of new markets and ideas. If I just look at the glass fiber industries that we did, discussed before. Um, no question that other countries make good quality products as well, but we have seen that, for instance, all the research and development, and all of the, the application, new application developments come actually out of the EU, and it, it, would, be, um, it would be sad to, to lose that. So I think there, there could be a bit of a rethinking to understand that having a value chain within the EU is is in itself worth something and something that we, we want to maintain and continue to have. So I'm just aware that uh, we have a time constraint here and we need to wrap up. There is one last question. So perhaps in your closing remarks, you could perhaps address this. The question is, is the concept of the union adequately defined? Perhaps Jochen, you'd like to have a brief one minute roundup and then Laurent can have a brief 30 second roundup because we're at time. So Jochen, over to you. Thank you, Natalia. Um, is the concept of union interest adequately defined? Um, I think it is important that the European Commission does take into account the global interest of the EU as a whole when imposing dumping measures or not. Um, how the weighting is done is, is indeed a question that has to be assessed in each individual case. 
Um, it, again, coming back to my previous point, I think it's important to keep a value chain in the EU and, and ultimately it, it, it should be to the benefit of all players in the value chain. And Thank you. Uh, if we could just pass to Laurent, I'm aware that uh, we're at the last minute. Laurent, have you got any concluding remarks before I close the webinar? Sure, and I think this topic of the union interest is a good lead into some final remarks because the union interest assessment by nature is a political assessment. And the, the key question for me is really to what extent do we allow objective policy considerations to have an important weight in that assessment uh, and give sufficient weight to the kind of considerations Jochen was talking about, whether it's the uh, employment and job creation, whether it's the value chain innovations and growth contribution, whether it's the principle uh, that we want to make sure there is a level playing field for EU industry. And uh, this brings me back to the, the title for the the session, which is you know, open strategic autonomy and having effective international trade tools. I think we're at a point where we realize more and more that the existing tools, at least as they have been interpreted, are not sufficient. And I think it's a question now of how far the EU is willing to go to expand its use of the existing tools, but also to go further in adopting new tools without necessarily waiting for WTO reforms. Thank you very much. So thank you, gentlemen, both for your presentations, which we hope were insightful and interesting for all the audience. We invite you to take up contact with either Jochen or Laurent to ask any follow-up questions. And we thank you very much for attending today and wish you a very good day. Goodbye. Thank you.